All right, we're up and running. Well, um, Sean, thank you for that very nice introduction. That's a, that's a good introduction to this. And uh, welcome, everyone. I saw many names, that uh, uh, friends, uh, associates, I'm, and it's wonderful to have you all with us today. And as Sean mentioned, I'm happy to take questions along the way. Um, we're just going to be looking at the last part of the last 1.8 million years. So, so the, the quaternary is the period of geologic time that encompasses the Pleistocene, that is the ice ages, uh, starting about 1.8 million years ago and running until about 11,800 years ago. And then the Holocene is the time that came since then. Uh, and we are talking about a new epoch called the uh, Anthropocene that we seem to be living in now. But so that's just to put us in the big geologic picture. So this is a reconstruction of what the Earth looked like approximately 18,000 years ago with large white areas representing glacial ice covering much of the Northern Hemisphere. And uh, this, this next view here shows North America uh, with it covered by its last ice sheet, which is called the Laurentide or Laurentide ice sheet. And that, um, that reached its maximum extent um, 20 odd thousand years ago. Uh, I have another slide. Uh, but the important thing to realize is the glacial ice covered uh, the region many times uh, in the last uh, almost two million years. And almost all the evidence that we see on land in the Northeast is from that last uh, time period. Uh, and in particular, we'll look at the glacial lake evidence. Um, this, this graph here um, shows years on the bottom from about 16,000 years ago on the left, uh, running up to about 10,000 years ago. And the idea is it's showing periods where the graph is low, uh, where the temperatures were colder, and then there was warming and cooling, and then a final warming as we began this Holocene time. Uh, so the glaciers are already retreating by this, this time 16,000 years ago. Um, and in the central region here is the time in which Northern, uh, Northern New England, when New England was covered uh, by this shifting mosaic of glacial lakes. Um, it was a time of rel relatively rapid warming, but also fluctuations, colder and warmer periods. Um, in this graph here, in this map, this shows the retreat of the ice. Um, here's Cape Cod and uh, Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket and Long Island down here. And from about 28 to 23,000 years ago, the ice was, uh, that was the, the southern limit of the glacial ice. Um, and then these other colored lines that cross the map, uh, here's Massachusetts, here's Vermont outlined here. These lines show uh, the reconstructions of how the glacial ice had melted back. Um, in particular, I'll just show you this, um, this blue line along here is from about 14,600 years ago when uh, the glacial ice was running through central Vermont and central New Hampshire. Everything south of here was free of the ice and everything north was still buried under this very thick ice sheet that was in places more than a mile thick. And what I'd like to do in the next uh, four or five slides is just show you some examples of some of the types of uh, features that were produced by this glacial ice and by the melting of it and then we'll get to the glacial lakes themselves. So this is a rock outcropping up uh, in the Smuggler's Notch ski area that uh, has uh, scratches or grooves in it. 
made by the glacial ice riding over it from um, the north, actually from the north uh, near my pack uh, to the south. Um, and and that can, that's a very common thing to see on uh, uh, rock outcroppings around the region. And that those scratches tell us the directions the ice uh, was moving in. Um, and here's a rock outcropping that was shaped by the glacial ice. And on the right-hand side, that's the north side. The ice came from, from right to left, north to south, going over this rock and plucking and steepening the, uh, the southern face of it. Uh, again, that sort of shaping is widespread in our landscape as the glacial ice was, was advancing over us. Uh, and here is some of the typical material that is left behind uh, when the ice melts. Um, this is glacial till. It's a, a mix of particles of all sizes, uh, in this case from sand up to boulders. Uh, some of it has a lot of clay in it as well. Uh, and that's the most common material you encounter when you start digging um, below the surface in Vermont. And here is an extremely large boulder uh, over in um, the Cabot area, um, uh, Devlin, Ruther Devlin Rutherford, my field assistant for scale. So this boulder's something like 15 feet high and 30, 35 feet across. Uh, it's probably not the biggest one, but it's one of the bigger ones. Um, and here is a, um, yeah, we're looking down a ridge of sand and gravel over in the Stowe area. And this ridge was produced by a stream flowing under the glacial ice out towards the margin. Um, and this is called an esker. And these winding ridges are seen here and there uh, throughout the region. And uh, they're, they're good indicators of where the glacial meltwater was, was flowing in the parts of the ice ice sheet that were near the near the edges. Um, and in this slide, um, this is um, a channel carved in the land surface out away from the glacial ice. This is the, the swampy area over in Marshfield near Lanesboro. Um, and, and this is a, a large valley that experienced very heavy flows of glacial meltwater as the ice was melting back. Uh, many of our valleys um, saw that sort of flow. Um, yeah, this slide here shows some lumpy sand and gravel hills uh, called cames. Uh, that, those are deposited in holes in the ice, um, places where water and sediment accumulated and then the ice melted away and the sediment collapsed, leaving these uh, features standing up above the landscape. Um, and then getting down below the surface a little, there are a wide variety of sand and gravel deposits. Some of them formed under the ice, like that esker deposit I showed you. Some of them formed as streams washed um, out from the edge of the glacial ice. And that's, that's what these sands are here. Um, but a lot, of the, a lot of the materials were deposited in lakes. Um, many of our lowland areas from the Connecticut River Valley over to the Champlain Valley were occupied at one time or another with one or more uh, water bodies, uh, partly because ice was preventing drainage uh, out to the sea uh, partly because the land surface had been depressed by hundreds of feet uh, due to the weight of that ice um, uh, depressing the crust of the earth. And that took time before it could rebound. So this map shows some of the largest glacial lakes in Vermont. Um, and we'll look at some examples from these. Uh, but I'll just start over here, over on the Connecticut side, the Connecticut River side. Um, there was a very large glacial lake called Lake Hitchcock, which extended from the, the West Burke area up in the north 
all the way down through Vermont and New Hampshire in the Connecticut River Valley down to central Connecticut. Um, that lake lasted several thousand years and it actually formed as the ice retreated to the north. So the oldest parts of it exist only in Connecticut. The middle age parts uh, extend through Connecticut and uh, Massachusetts and southern Vermont. And the, the youngest parts of it um, uh, were a lake that uh, stretched all the way from Rocky Hill and New Britain, Connecticut up, up to West Burke. So this is definitely probably the longest glacial lake in all of the northeastern U.S. Uh, but there are there are several others as well. Uh, glacial Lake Winooski in the um, central Vermont area and a series of glacial lakes over in the, um, the uh, Champlain Valley. Um, uh, they have various names. Uh, Lake Vermont is the overarching name. And then there was a there was a high level of glacial Lake Vermont called Coveville, named for a place where the outlet is in, in uh, Eastern New York and Lower Fort Anne. And, and then there is a later body called the Champlain Sea that formed as ice had retreated up into Canada and, and marine waters were finally able to get up through the St. Lawrence. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that one. Um, so, so there's a variety of glacial lakes, and I like to use the term um, a shifting mosaic because some of these glacial lakes existed for a few years, and some of them, as in the case of Lake Hitchcock, um, existed for several thousand years. Um, I think at this point, um, Sean, I wonder, are, are any questions building up that we should tackle now? I'm glad you asked because there was just one question. The um, uh, question is, do most of these glacial lakes gradually recede or do they have a massive flood out when um, ice dams break? Uh, it appears that a lot of the, lot of the drainages were quite rapid. Um, there are places where uh, we get, say, a partial drainage in one of these lakes, such as in uh, Lake Winooski when it's level lowered. Uh, where we think we can actually see in the record of the of the sediment layers pretty much the the year that it happened maybe it's the day that it happened it's hard to tell but uh, some of these glacial lake drainages were quite catastrophic and and that seems to be because the the lake was being held in either by glacial ice and once the water finally started to seep around the edge of the ice in, in the right way, um, it's just sort of a runaway process. The water melts the ice and, and the, the larger um, space lets more water drain out. And then in other cases, such as Lake Hitchcock, uh, down in Connecticut, it was dammed by a um, glacial deposit of sand and gravel, it's not something you'd really want to build a permanent dam with. It's amazing it lasted so long, uh, but they, they do indeed seem to drain rapidly usually. Anything else? Well, that's it for now. Okay, all right, all right. So what I'd like to do at this point is show you an example of a modern glacial lake, and then we'll look at um, some maps and photos of uh, lake deposits uh, in, in our region. Um, what I've got here is a lake that is uh, sort of trapped between a large glacier in eastern Iceland and um, some glacial moraine deposits, ridges of sand and gravel, uh, that uh, that block the drainage from, from getting out to the uh, Atlantic Ocean out here. Uh, this is a really cool site on the southeastern side of Iceland. And we're going to zoom in a little bit. Um, let's see, this is about five kilometers here. That's about three miles across there. Um, the one road in, in southeastern Iceland goes right past it. And it's a wonderful tourist stop. I've been there, it's quite amazing. Um, here's 
here's the glacial ice with that actually flows in this direction. And here's some remnants of the uh, ridges that are keeping this water, this meltwater from going right out to the ocean. And I'm gonna zoom in one more time. Um, this is taken uh, at a different date and so it looks a little different. Um, so we got glacial ice here. In the summertime, there's massive amounts of water pouring out from under the ice and icebergs breaking off and floating around and swirling around. And you can actually see a bit of a big sort of whirlpool here. It's not because the water's draining out in the center there. It's because sediment is pouring in from this direction and it's also pouring in from a stream that comes off the glacier over here. And they set up this really cool whirlpool. Um, um, I, I assume it's rather slow. You can actually take a boat ride around this lake and it, among the icebergs and it's really a, quite a cool place. I should have thrown in a photo from uh, on the, the water level. Uh, so that what one term for this is a glacial lake it can also be called a proglacial lake. That's a lake that is formed um, uh, specifically between the glacial ice here and um, something that's impounding it, such as old glacial ridges. Um, other, so this lake is really held in place by that ridge. Other lakes are trapped by ice, um, and we'll see examples of that. All right, so. Here's a view that Colin Dowie, uh, who was uh, formerly at the Vermont Geological Survey, put together uh, to try and show the, the situation in central Vermont. And we'll look at this on a couple different maps. But so here's this glacial Lake Winooski that was here at the end of the Pleistocene time. Um, and its deposits are all around us. Any of you that live in central Vermont, all of our lowlands are filled with these deposits. Um, Barry is over in here, Montpelier in this area, um, Middlesex, um, uh, Waterbury, Stowe's up in here. The lake actually was quite extensive, um, uh, extending over almost to Richmond and down through the Mad River Valley for fairways. Dog River Valley, uh, Stevens Branch Valley, on, on up uh, through uh, uh, Cabot and, um, oh, uh, oh, let's I get a little confused. Cabot, this is the North Branch Valley, Worcester, Cabot, Callis, Woodbury, and then on over in here, up through the Lamoille Valley, up even into Hardwick and on over to uh, through the Johnson area. Um, so this lake was over 300 square miles. It was not particularly long lived, something on the order of 300 years or so, I guess. But now what's holding this lake in? Uh, the waters today, you know, this is the Winooski River Valley, probably most of you are familiar with. The main Winooski comes down through here and flows right out to Lake Champlain. But um, uh, 12,000 years ago, 13,000 approximately, actually, I'm sorry, call it 14,000, I'm fussing here. Um, the, the ice was still filling the Champlain Valley and the waters were unable to drain out uh, through, the, through the Champlain lowland. Instead, the drainage for this particular lake was through Williamstown Gulf. That happened to be the low point where waters could make their way uh, southward. Um, now in the next slides, we'll back up a little and show you how this lake formed. Uh, so here we are at a slightly earlier stage. Um, the origin of Lake Winooski goes back to somewhere around 14,100 years ago. Um, Stephen Wright from UVM put together this nice image. So before Lake Winooski formed, the, the ice was um, blocking the main Winooski Valley 
which is out here. And so instead, small lakes were formed in the Stevens Branch Valley, uh, Barry about here, um, in the Dog River Valley, here's Lake Roxbury, and in the Mad River Valley, uh, Lake Granville. Uh, in each of those cases, the low point, the place where water could flow out, um, was up, up in what is now the highlands. Granville Gulf over, there's my pointer, Granville Gulf over here, um, the um, uh, Roxbury Gulf here, um, and uh, uh, the um, Stevens Branch uh, Valley here, um, Williamstown Gulf. And each of those flowed on down to what is now the, the uh, White River watershed. But at the time, they flowed down a ways and entered uh, that glacial Lake Hitchcock that I showed you earlier. So the waters from one glacier or one set of glacial lakes flowed down in, into another. Uh, so that was at the early stages, around 14,100 years. Uh, as the ice retreated uh, northward, the main Winooski Valley opened up and those three lakes were able to coalesce. And instead of draining out through these outlets at um, Granville Gulf and um, uh, Roxbury Gulf, uh, they were now all able to uh, drain through uh, Williamstown Gulf. So that was the low point in the place where the water could drain. And there were massive volumes of water generated as, as these cubic miles worth of ice melted away in a relatively short time. Uh, I have to think that there was quite a bit of uh, white water potential or hydropower potential, however you want to think of it, uh, at the outlet of, uh, of uh, Glacial Lake Winooski for quite some time. So at, when this image um, was constructed, or, or the, the time that this image shows, shows the ice um, free ice-free Montpelier, um, it, but we don't yet have an ice-free um, Waterbury. So this is a relatively early stage of the lake. The ice is continuing to retreat um, and the lake continues to get larger. So this next slide shows the, the maximum extent of the lake. So we've got ice retreated back, melted back to um, the vicinity of Richmond, things are about to change. Uh, so the vicinity of Richmond and on up into the um, areas west of Johnson up in the north. And there's still ice filling the valleys in uh, northernmost Vermont at that time. So this was a huge lake at this point. Um, let's see. And, at this point, I just want to mention that I talked about the land surface being tilted. Uh, the glacial ice uh, standing on top of the land for thousands of years depressed it by hundreds of feet. Although that depression was greater in the northern parts of our region than in the southern parts. So when the ice was removed, the sea level came up rapidly as, as ice around the world began to melt um, and the land surface slowly began to um, uh, uh, rebound. And at this point, whenever we map a shoreline of a glacial lake, we have to take that rebound into account. Every time in, in the Winooski Valley, when we go towards the north northwest, a kilometer, six tenths of a mile, we have to, uh, the shoreline is over a meter higher. So it's, it's uh, something a little less than um, four feet higher. Uh, it's actually 4.7 feet for every mile. It's a little less per kilometer. So the shorelines are appreciably higher as you go from say Williamstown up to uh, Johnson. So that's something we take into account as we make these uh, these reconstruction maps. Um, 
So, um, Sean, how are we doing for questions now? Uh, looks like nothing new in the in the chat bar yet. If uh, folks have joined midway, you're welcome to uh, put a question in the chat bar. That's up at the towards the top right of your screen. If you're using a computer or a laptop, um, feel free to add anything you'd like in the chat bar. Thanks. That's great. That's great. Okay, so um, in this next slide, I I want to show you. Um, what the deposits look like that form as as rivers enter lakes. Um, those are called deltas, and they, they form around the world in a wide variety of settings. Um, and we've used those sorts of deposits as evidence to figure out how um, the lakes formed in Vermont. Um, here's a modern example in a glacially scoured valley in, in the mountains of Norway. It's an it's a amazing place. Um, it's hundreds of feet down from this, this ridge that you hike along down to the, the lake built in a, that's uh, in a U-shaped glacial valley. Um, a stream is flowing in from the bottom left and entering the lake and all this dark here is the sediment of that stream pouring out into the lake. I think this is actually turbid water here. Uh, uh, but uh, deltas just like this are, are what formed uh, the deposits in, in our valleys today. Um, and here's an extremely modern delta. This is about 2.8 acres across. It's a, a few hundred feet across from one side to the other. And this this is in the Waterbury Reservoir, and it's forming today as we speak, as a brook um, uh, on which a large landslide occurred last spring uh, pours sediment down into the reservoir. So the stream has a certain capacity because of its velocity to carry sand and gravel and silt and mud along. But as it reaches the reservoir, the gradient drops and the stream no longer is able to move that sediment. So what you get is a deposit. And these deposits um, grade down right to the level of the water. Um, this is, this is uh, in the lower right here, this is the Cotton Brook stream coming in to the reservoir out here. And you can actually, if you don't mind getting wet and maybe sink, sinking up to your knees, you can walk out to the edge there where the fine sediment is just spilling off into the reservoir. Uh, it's a wonderful example of a modern delta. Uh, so um, the deposits we're looking at are on a larger scale. This is, this is a delta formed into Glacial Lake Hitchcock in the upper Connecticut Valley, up around Colebrook. And uh, this is a vast deposit, many feet thick and probably hundreds of acres in extent formed as a stream um, flushed sediment into the, into the glacial lake. And by Looking at the details of the deposits, looking at where the, the flat lying layers up here intersect with the sloping layers here, we can get an extremely accurate view of what the lake level was. Because it turns out that this junction between the flat lying sediments and the um, sloping sediments uh, is just about exactly the lake level. That's what we were seeing back here. There's, there's sloping sediments going down out into the water out there that you can't see. And by looking at this present day lake lev uh, level of the delta deposit here, we, we, uh, we have evidence of, of the, the lake level. So uh, these, are, these deposits are widespread around the region. Um, geologists who study glacial Deposits spend a lot of time in sand and gravel pits. And here's, here's one in Maine. Um, here's another one over in Eastern New York State. Uh, and the details of these deposits, the, the various sorts of layers and the way they tilt and, and uh, can tell us a lot about the directions in which water was flowing as well as the um, elevations at which the lakes formed. 
Here's, a, here's one in the Barry area. Um, so in these next two slides, uh, I just want to show you what some of the other deposits look like. The ones I have been showing you were delta deposits formed right as streams come out into the lake. So, so they're near the shoreline. But out in the middle of those glacial lakes, some very peculiar deposits um, were laid down. Um, and we call these fine-grained deposits um, that were formed in the glacial lakes uh, varves, V-A-R-V-E-S. Um, uh, varves are annual layers. And um, I'll show you a slide in a moment that shows more detail but you'll see that there are dark layers and light layers, and they alternate back and forth. It turns out the dark layers are very fine-grained silt and clay, and the lighter layers are coarser silt and fine sand. And it, they sound similar, but they form in very different settings. Um, it turns out that the coarser grain layers, in this case, they're slightly rusty, looking slightly pinkish. The coarser grain silts and fine sands are deposited during the summertime when the streams are flowing. But especially in glacial times, um, once the climate would get cold at the end of, a, end of the summer and everything would freeze up, uh, gla glacial waters would stop flowing into the lakes the land surface would be frozen and snow covered, and very little sediment would come into the lakes. Uh, however, um, there was material to be deposited because fine silt and clay had been roiling around in the lake all summer, and it never could settle out because there was too much current in the water. And so these darker colored layers could finally settle out in the winter. So the coarser grain layers formed in the summer, darker in the winter. And by looking at these layers closely and counting the layers, um, we actually can reconstruct the history of these lakes. Uh, these two slides, our photos, show a site that I investigated out behind the Montpelier Police Station in 2006. There was a large excavation this was November. It was raining. It was cold, but it was a very temporary excavation. And we, we saw a beautiful exposure of the lake deposits. And with the help of uh, Brett Engstrom and Charlie Cogbill, I think that's Brett there. Probably Charlie took the photo. Um, we were able to document and count the different layers. Um, each of these golf tees um, is separated by five years of deposit. And so you were seeing 15, something like 20 plus years right in this, in this photo and over 200 years of deposit in, in the overall section there. Uh, so it's a bit like tree rings. Uh, we can actually do correlations uh, looking at sections uh, throughout the Winooski River Valley and even in, into other river valleys and that starts to help us work out the, the patterns. Uh, so uh, the coarse grain deposits out on the shorelines tell us the level that lakes stood at. And these fine grain deposits way out in the middle of the lakes, away from the, the streams, those can show us um, uh, the timing, uh, how, how many years a particular lake uh, existed. George, we have one question. Yes. Um, wondering if there's any clues to the biology of the time that gets caught up in the silt and sand or perhaps clay deposits. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, there are tantalizing pieces of evidence. They're fragmentary, but um, Jack Ridge down at Tufts University has studied these deposits in great detail, and he has found the trace marks on some of the bedding surfaces in the, in the lake deposits of um, Arctic char. And uh, there are some small microorganisms and, and um, 
uh, let's see, ostracods, are, you know, very tiny little organisms. Those have been uh, sifted out of the deposits. Um, also, there are some hints of the biology, but these lakes seem to have been pretty low in their productivity. There wasn't a lot of life in them, but there were some. And it's one of those fields uh, that, that probably there's a lot more opportunity for discoveries. Um, I keep looking. Um, and there is a report from the late 19th century of uh, a geologist finding a fish skeleton in one of these deposits, but the fish got lost somewhere over the intervening decades. And um, so we assume it existed. He was a very reliable observer, but uh, not much. <laughs> Okay, um, so the, I mentioned these deposits are all around us. This is an excavation out in front of the Kellogg Hubbard Library in Montpelier. Uh, well, I happened upon, they, were, they had it open one day and there was some, uh, a couple of feet of artificial fill. And then I believe some stream deposits probably from the North Branch or the Winooski River. And then as we got down in here, there were some very clear uh, clay and silt deposits, just like I showed you earlier from the behind the police station. And so very clearly Montpelier itself is underlain by the glacial lake deposits. Um, here's a, a small landslide in the lake deposits on Route 2 uh, in between East Montpelier and uh, the power dam if anyone knows that area. This is a spot where the Agency of Transportation has had a lot of trouble over the last few decades because the slope uh, kept uh, failing. Uh, clay can be a difficult material to work with for foundations. Uh, and my last slide on the, on the clay topic is, uh, here are some examples of the brickyards that once existed in the Winooski Valley. Uh, in Waitsfield, Essex, and Waterbury, uh, and many other places, um, there were brickyards. If anyone is picking up old bricks in the Montpelier area, and you see any uh, name with the name Drury, D-R-U-R-Y, uh, stamped in them, well, that was a big brickyard over in Essex. And um, here's a photo of Matt's. I saw Matt was on the, on the, uh, presentation here. And this is just a nod to trying to think a little bit about what the landscape looked like as those lakes existed and perhaps right after the lakes um, had finally drained as the ice retreated further north. Um, here is uh, an area up north of the St. Lawrence in Quebec showing a uh, scattered spruce woodland um, with uh, herbaceous and low woody vegetation uh, getting going. This area was more recently deglaciated than, than Vermont. The ice retreated more recently. Um, and maybe it, maybe it serves as a bit of a model. Uh, let's see. Um, now, I, I think it's a good time to check in for other que uh, uh, questions, but I wanted to make sure that folks had some had some good resources to look at. And I would especially recommend going to the Vermont Geological Survey website. Their Vermont Geology section has uh, some new maps and presentations on glacial lakes, which you might find helpful. And here are some other resources as well. Um, now I wanted to check in with Sean as far as how time is going. How are we doing here? We're doing great on time and we have a few good questions. Okay, yeah, and we could take some questions and then there is a, a short video on uh, showing the glacial lakes changing over time if we okay, wanna great. try and run that. But uh, so what do we have for questions? Sure, so one question is, are these deposits still, um, still damp or wet? Um, and I'm gonna expand on that question a little bit. Um, so presumably they're not still damp or wet from, from uh, you know, glacial waters by any means, but I was also wondering if you could talk about how some of the, how, how rainfall and groundwater interacts with some of these really fine deposits. Yeah, oh, that's really interesting. Well, it is very possible 
to trap water in sediments and have it last for thousands or even millions of years. Um, I think that the water that we see in our fine grain deposits probably is not the original water because although it's very um, impermeable, the water does slowly move through it. Um, it can serve as a great enough barrier so that when we try and pump water out, uh, the, we can't, new water is unable to come in fast enough. So it can serve as a barrier to, to water flow in that sense. Uh, the sand deposits are very permeable. Water runs right through them. Uh, but the silt and clay deposits, water moves very slowly. And um, that's something that's important to understand if we're citing um, something like a, um, a landfill. You want to have impermeable materials under that. And nowadays, of course, they use synthetic liners to, to ensure that there's not water movement. But the, the presence of silt and clay deposits in our valley bottoms has a big influence on whether uh, uh, water sources below them are protected. Um, uh, there are places in our valley bottoms where you can drill fairly deep wells, maybe 100 or 200 feet down go through upper river deposits and then go through uh, lake sands and then lake clays. And sometimes there are sand and gravel deposits related to the glaciers, such as esker deposits down below. Uh, and those can be very good water sources because they're protected to a great extent by the clay on top of them. Um, how does that sound? Sounds great to me. Uh, another question, Richard is asking, how come the hill behind the police station in Montpelier is so hilly? Shouldn't fluvial deposits really be spread out or is there previously a river coming down off of East State Street? I guess generally, can you speak to the, the hilliness of the topography around here that by all accounts ought to be flat if it's all originated from, from uh, deposits like this? Well, um, all these, these um uh, glacial deposits are erodible. You know, rivers can wash them away, but and they have moved huge volumes of sediment through our valleys. If you think about Montpelier in particular, starting up at the level of Vermont College, uh, that those are lake deposits at Vermont College. Uh, they go back to the the lake that came after Lake Winooski, uh, called Lake Mansfield. Um, and we'll see that in the video that I'll show in a, a minute. Uh, we'll see that happen. Uh, but the deposits were hundreds of feet thick, and in many places they have been eroded down to bedrock. But our streams have only had um, about 12, 13,000 years to do that in. And it, that's the entire history of human civilization, yeah, but it's not very long. And our streams can only do so much. Uh, so it just hasn't been long enough since these things were deposited, probably is the answer. And um, we have had very heavy cover of vegetation on our landscape for many thousands of years, and that has slowed down the rates of erosion. Uh, one been? other related question. I'm thinking maybe we, there's, a, there's a few questions in the hopper here, but maybe we'll do one more and then we can do um the the video and then after that return back to the rest of the questions here okay um so one question is were the various lakes lowering at a consistent rate or do they raise and lower as the ice periodically retreated and advanced you know i'm i'm sure that some did increase in elevation in places but it's hard to know that um a lot of times we know the greatest elevation that a particular lake had um, and usually what's happening is the barrier that's preventing them from draining is getting eroded eventually. So I think that most of them were on a downward course, but some of them must have gone up and down. Oh, hard to know. All right. Um, well, what I'll try and do is show you an animation that Julia Boyles from the Vermont Geological Survey put together. So this is a series of maps 
And I, I think I can sort of talk while it runs. And it just takes a couple of minutes. And I will hope that I can get it to run. Uh, let's see. You know, I'm going to just uh, run to it. Here we go. Okay, so this starts out showing Glacial Lake Hitchcock and the early stages of Glacial Lake Vermont. Now Lake Winooski has formed uh, and lower stages of it, Mansfield 1 and Mansfield 2. And now Lake Vermont is at its full extent. Lake Hitchcock still exists. And Lake Vermont is lowering. Ice is retreating further north. Now we have what's called the Champlain Sea. Okay, that goes kind of fast, but, and then present day Lake, um, Lake Champlain. All right, that was, that was kind of quick, but uh, you, can, you can view that. <laughs> um, George, maybe I'll take some of these, um, these links and link to this video. And when we put up the recording of this webinar on our website, I'll include the, these links below the webinar so folks can, can access this stuff. Sure, sure. And one thing I'll add about that is um, it would be great if over time we can add some details. Like we don't currently show the way the glacial ice is melting back, which would make that make a lot more sense. But so so just to sort of conclude, um, this evidence of glacial lakes is is present throughout our low areas uh, throughout the state, and uh, you see it everywhere you look. Okay, and you had some more questions, Sean? Yeah, thanks, George. Um, so one question, are the big boulders up in Smuggler's Notch left directly by glaciers or did they flow downhill and land there from above? Those boulders, probably all of them fell off of the surrounding cliffs. Um, there, those boulders in particular, I have done work up there. They are, they are fallen from the cliffs. All right. Uh, Hannah Allen is commenting, one of her favorite museum displays she's ever seen was in the Natural History Museum in Salt Lake City, Utah. It was a giant topographic map that you could fill with water and there were marks to show where the water was in any given year. Um, has anyone you know ever considered making a model like this um, here in, in Vermont? I love that idea. It, it may be more likely to be done as a virtual thing these, these days, knowing how things go, but I like that idea. Well, I know uh, the Friends of the Winooski River has a stream table that can show the how water cuts through sediment over time. It'd be great to have the uh, the analogous uh, uh, glacial meltwater version of that. Yeah. Well, well, maybe we'll have to make a lake table as well. Yeah. Um, all right. Can you can you talk about the south end of Willoughby of Lake Willoughby? We've noticed on lidar that there is a well-defined valley, making it look like Willoughby drained to the south, maybe rapidly. Um, so that's that's question one from Don. Okay. Yeah. On that one, I haven't worked up there, but I've looked at some of the earlier geologic work done by Bud Abbott, um, who was a geologist at Linden State College for a long time, and I know that that there were glacial moraines there as I, a tongue of ice retreated uh, northward through there. And I believe that there would have been water flow there, but I'm not sure if there was ice flow there uh, or a, a lake drainage through there or not. Uh, there's much of uh, northeastern Vermont where we really haven't done enough uh, geologic studies. Okay. Let's see what we got. Um, if anybody else has any other questions, now's your chance to throw them into the chat bar. I'm going to do, no, do another pass through here and make sure I haven't uh, missed anything. Uh, let's see. Uh, Matt, oh, um, 
Oh yeah, here we go. Yeah, Matt Peters, um, do you have any clear estimate of the volume of glacial lake sediments that has been flushed out into Lake Champlain and beyond by subsequent erosion? For example, uh, was there once a flat sediment plain from the College of Montpelier out to the lake? Um, I think that there was. That we know that the early rivers were cutting very rapidly through this sediment because the landscape was not nearly as vegetated as it is today. There, were no, there was not continuous forest present over it. So when you look out across uh, Montpelier today from the Vermont College level, we think that the lake bottom was about there. Uh, it, in the first few hundred years after the lake drained, it probably cut down close to its present level. We've certainly seen some sites. I, I studied a site in the Mad River Valley where it was clear that the Mad River was running very close to its current level by something like 9,000 years ago. So it had cut down from uh, much higher because that valley too was filled with lake deposits. It had cut down at least 50 or 100 feet in, in that time period. So. So the volume is huge, Matt, and we haven't really calculated it yet. Um, there was an old estimate of uh, how much material came out of the uh, Kingsbury Branch Valley, and I could look that up. And it's a big number, and, and it's probably fairly a good, a good guesstimate. All right, well, I wanna uh, thank George for um, his time and thank you very much for reaching out and, and presenting this to us. This is, a, this is a mystery that I've always wanted such rich visuals and, and expert um, narration to help understand. So, so thank you very much, George. We'll have this webinar up uh, on our website, the recording of this on northbranchnaturecenter.org slash online. Um, so in maybe about 48 hours or so, by Monday morning at the, at the latest, um, we'll have that up there and, and I'll put up some of these other links that George uh, has mentioned so you can explore some of these resources yourself. Um, I'm just gonna look uh, to see if there's any last questions um, before, oh, we have a couple more questions. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll do a little victory lap of, uh, of, of rapid fire questions here if, uh, if you don't mind, George. Oh, glad to. Glad well, to. Uh, Brian's asking, how deep did the lakes get? Um, in places, these lakes were two or three hundred feet deep. It all depends on the topography. And then uh, Deborah's asking, are old shorelines visible on the geomorphology of Vermont? Uh, with the new um, uh, laser topographic mapping, the LIDAR mapping that we have today, a, a lot of the shorelines do show up. Um, maybe we can post something that shows an example of that. I'll, I'll talk with Sean on that. Uh, in the past, our topographic maps sort of kind of showed some of those features pretty well. Um, when our topo maps had 20 foot contour lines, but uh, we really can see many of these features today. Yeah. And one place I'm always thinking of uh, for, for visualizing this is when you're when you're driving on uh, on I-89 west towards, well, either way, uh, between Montpelier and Burlington and you're in the, um, you know, you're, you're between Waterbury and Richmond and you look up and on both sides, there's this perfect bathtub almost bathtub ring, uh, flat line, um, yeah, right about 620 feet or something like that. Um, so, so look, when you're on the interstate, look for those, those flat terraces on both sides of you and, and you're looking at the shorelines of, of Lake Vermont. Yeah, that, yeah, you're right there. There, sometimes the terraces are the lake bottom and sometimes they are the shoreline, but that's a great area to be looking. Yeah. Uh, one question from Aaron, where did the vast sand deposits in Chittenden County come from and why do we have silt here in Montpelier while they have sand? Well, okay, we both have sand, <laughs> but um, down in the, the um, Champlain Valley, um, a lot of that sediment came out off the glaciers and there was a huge um, glacier hanging out in the northern part of the Champlain Valley with streams flowing out of it out 
underwater into uh, Lake Vermont, uh, bringing sediment out. Uh, and both areas do have fine grain deposits, but, but uh, the farther the sediment is uh, transported, the more likely the coarse grain stuff is to be left behind. Um, so there's, and, there's a mix in both places. All right, last question. Um, is there a, a look, is there a map that shows um, eskers in the state? Um, I don't think we really have put together a modern one, but there is a uh, surficial geology map of Vermont from 1970 that you can see on the Vermont Geological Survey website. And if you zoom in on it, there are um, some of the eskers are shown. Uh, but we're, we're working on improving the maps. Super. Well, George, I want to thank you one more time for, for joining us this evening. Um, hope you and everyone else has a uh, wonderful weekend. Everybody be well, stay curious, and, uh, and be in touch. And thank you, Sean, for the opportunity. Uh, stay well, everyone.